And uh, all righty, thank you, sir. Uh, I forgot to put an offering in. And uh, all right, woohoo! God is good. And uh, amen, Ski. All righty, grab your Bibles, please, if you wouldn't mind. Open them to the Gospel according to St. John, chapter number 13. John, chapter number 13. We're going to use our Bibles approximately a half a dozen times tonight. And uh, please keep your Bibles handy as we go through uh, the different scripture verses tonight. And uh, you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. I'm so happy to be here. Always come to church with a good spirit, a great attitude. It makes all the difference in the world. All righty. John chapter, God bless you, sir. God bless you. John chapter 13, and look down at verse number one. If you would, please, we're going to read verses one all the way through to verse number 17. John chapter number 13. And uh, if you could please look down at verse number one and uh, all the way down to verse number 17. The Bible says this, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should, is everything okay? Everything's good? Okay, all right. Look at, look at verse number one, John chapter 13 and verse number one. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And, and by the way, thank God Jesus loves us unto the end. Amen. Look at verse number two. And, uh, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, verse number 17 is my key thought for this evening. It says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. All right, so this is these things, part number 37. The title of my message is this, know and do these things. Know and do these things. Let's pray together tonight. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I sure do love you, and I'm so grateful for all that you do for us, dear Lord. And Lord, I pray now that you'll come upon this service, Holy Spirit of God, give us your presence, your power, 
Please, Lord, give me the mind of Christ as I preach. Help me to say exactly what you once said. I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And, Father, I pray for uh, every person watching online that you'll bless them as well. Help us all to be attentive to the Holy Spirit of God and help us to make the decisions that you want us to make. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I have often learned that when it comes to a family, and that's really what the church of God is, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, specifically those that are here like in the same church, you know, we're, you know, God's children if we're saved, you know, all over the world, right? But God, God says the, the local New Testament church is the body of Christ. And so we are members one of another as far as our, you know, the body of Christ. And it's so important that we treat each other with love and respect and kindness. It's so important that we are also respectful of authority and not disgruntled and not trying to say negative things and critical things. And we just want to be, you know, encouraging each other. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Always come to church with the mindset that you want to exhort each other and encourage each other. You know, the devil sometimes gets involved in churches like ours when he comes in on someone's shoulder and just wants to be negative and critical and just tear down and disagree and not like and this, that, and the other. Well, that's never helpful for the cause of Christ whatsoever. And we need to love each other, encourage each other, support each other. But one of the things that the Bible is clear is to be respectful of authority. That's super, super obvious in the Bible. Children always respect their parents. Young people always respect the elders, you know, the, those that are older, right? And, and especially, you know, the senior citizens, treating them with respect. And then church members always being respectful of the pastor and uh, the staff as far as assistant pastors. It, it's, you know, citizens being respectful of those in authority like uh, politicians and police officers. It's all in the Bible, and it's extremely important that we have that mindset and that we have that right spirit every single time that we walk through the doors of this church. Now, I've got something very, very important that I want to teach you tonight, and I hope this will be a help to every single person here. You know what? I see Christians often who are not happy Christians. They're not. I mean, they got a frown so long on their face and they're so, you know, unhappy. It's, it's sad because God is a God of joy and a God of happiness and a God of love. And we all should experience joy and happiness in our Christian life. And I, I just believe the devil is the one that tries to get us not to be happy. Look, you've only got one shot at this thing called life. You've only got a certain number of years to live. You might as well live it with joy in your heart and happiness. Look at life and just enjoy your life. You know, if something's wrong in your life, fix it. If, uh, if you're away from God, get close to God. If the preaching of the word of God is convicting to your heart, don't get mad at the preacher. Let the Holy Spirit have his way in your life and just simply do what the Holy Spirit says. And I promise you, you're going to be happy. You're going to be happy. And so in verse number 17 of John chapter number 13, I uh, let's see here. Oh, here we go. It simply says this. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. If you know them and do them, God says you're going to be happy. Jesus is teaching the disciples four very important truths about Christian living. Jesus said, happy are ye if ye do them. All right, so let's basically understand the background of John chapter number 13. There's something that's absolutely amazing that took place in this chapter. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Wait a second, he not only washed his disciples' feet, he washed the feet of Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him. Here he is, one by one, washing all 12 of the disciples' feet. And he comes up to Judas Iscariot, 
And he said, hey, if I wash your feet, you're all clean. He said, but there's one. It says in verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, he that is washed, needeth not saved to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore, said he, you're not all clean. So here he is. Here's, this is amazing. I mean, apps, we're talking the Son of God. We're talking about Jesus Christ who, who hung the stars in their place and the moon and the sun and the earth and created life. And he's, he owns everything in the universe. I mean, he's God in the flesh. And he bows down on his knees and he takes a water basin and a towel and he washes the feet of the very one who's going to just a few hours from then, a few days from then, betray him. What an example. I mean, just incredible. So Jesus does all of this. Of course, Simon Peter, you know, he, he often didn't understand what was going on. So he spoke out and said, oh, Jesus, don't please don't wash my feet. And uh, Jesus said, hey, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you have nothing to do with me. And he goes, oh, he goes, well, uh, not just my feet, but how about my hands and my head too? And uh, I could see Jesus looking at Peter, just smiling and said, Peter, all I need to do is wash your feet and that's sufficient. You'll be clean if you just let me wash your feet. And so then he did that, right? So then he comes down and in verse number um Verse number 12, Jesus said, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments he was, and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye not, uh, excuse me, know ye what I have done to you? And then he says, do you understand what I'm doing here? And then he proceeds in the next four verses to teach them four things. And after he, in these next four verses, teaches them four things, he then summarizes and finishes this whole chapter, um, or this paragraph, I should say, uh, in verse 17 by saying, if ye know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So here's what he was saying. If you know these things, but you don't do them, you're not happy. You know what that means? The most miserable person in this room is the Christian who knows what God wants him or her to do, and yet they don't do it. I used to hear Dr. Jack Hiles when I was a college student at Hiles Anderson College. He'd say, the most miserable person in the whole world is not an unsafe person living in sin or wickedness. He said, the most miserable person in this world is the Christian who's not living in the will of God for his life. That's the most miserable person. So God, Jesus says to his disciples, happy are ye if you not only know these things, but do them. All right, let's look at these four things and find out what Jesus taught his disciples, and then we'll find out what we can learn as we're reading the scripture. And obviously, it's not just for the disciples, it's for all of us because it's in the word of God. All right, look down at verse number 13. Let's take a look here at the first of these four things. He says, ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. All right, number one, the first thing Jesus was saying to his disciples was this. Number one, call Jesus your master and Lord. That's number one. Call Jesus your master and Lord. Now listen this carefully. I wrote this down. Jesus should be more to you than a savior. Listen to this. If you are saved today, Jesus is your savior, amen? But he should be more than that to you. Jesus should not just be fire insurance from hell. Jesus should not just be, well, now that I died on the cross to save your soul from, from hell and you called upon my name and, and put your faith and trust in me alone, uh, I'm your savior. That's awesome, but listen, that's only the first thing, I mean, Salvation is, the, is entering Christianity. That's what it is. You, you can't be a Christian unless you're number one, first of all, unless you're saved. So Jesus was saying here, you call me master and Lord, and he said, it's well that you do that. You should do that. So let me give you the definitions of these two words. The word master, it has several meanings, but let me give you four of them. Um, the word master means one who rules. One who rules. Next, governs. One who governs. Next, one who directs. In other words, he tells you what direction to go. 
And then number four, it simply means an instructor. So when you see that Jesus is our master, that means he is one who rules, governs, directs, and instructs. He's an instructor. Let me ask you a question. All of you that are here tonight, Jesus is your savior. Let me ask you a question. Does he rule over your life? Is he your master? He should be. You want to be a happy Christian? Stop living your life the way you want to live it. Live your life the way that Jesus tells you to live it. And then you're going to be happy. Let him be your master. Keep your uh, bookmarker or piece of paper or your finger in John 13. Go to Luke chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1. Let's see what, Jesus, what, what, what the people did in the times of Christ that's mentioned in the Bible that we can glean from and learn from. All right, so just go to John chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse number 35 and go down to verse number 45. All right, John chapter 1. We'll start reading in verse number 35. It simply says this, Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following now, here's what happened. All, all John the Baptist said was, hey, this is the Lamb of God. And two of John's disciples, hey, we're going to follow the Lamb of God. That's basically what happened, right? Now, look with this in verse 38. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, what seek ye? They said unto him, watch this, rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the uh, two which um, heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, that's another uh, expression for Savior, which is, which, uh, is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, ready, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Okay, so we see here that in the Bible, right at the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, he not only saved people, but he said to them, follow me. And the, and, and the two disciples of John, when they started following Jesus, they said, Rabbi, which is being interpreted, Master. So you know what they were doing? They were saying, you're our Master. You're not just our Savior. You're our Master. And by the way, that's appropriate. Have you ever in your entire life, made Jesus your master. Does he have an opportunity to rule in your life? If he says to you, do this, will you do it? If he says, go here, will you go? If he says, stop sinning, will you stop? If he says, I want to govern your future, I want to govern your life and tell you how to live, I want to direct your path, I want to instruct you on how to believe and how to live. All these people that get all bent out of shape about Bible preaching and bent out of shape about doctrine that I preach from the pulpit here. I wonder if Jesus gets bent out of shape about Bible preaching. I wonder if Jesus says, Pastor, would you stop talking about that so much? Listen, if it's in the Bible, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jesus wants me to talk about it. Amen? And, um, and by the way, if you think I only talk about one thing, the problem is you don't come to church enough. If you come Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you'll, you'll, you'll hear that I talk about a lot of things. I mean, on uh, Wednesday nights, we've had 78 doctrines of the Bible that we've been discussing. That's 78 different topics, right? I don't just harbor on one thing, but I do talk about whatever's in the Bible. And so here's the thing, make Jesus your 
master. That's what is appropriate. The second thing that we see here, as far as uh, it says, call Jesus your master and Lord, the second word is the word Lord. If you're taking notes, here's the definition of the word Lord. Ready? It simply means the supreme in authority. Supreme in authority. Okay, so watch this. In every single person in this room, you have an authority figure or multiple authority figures. Now, you can disobey them and disrespect them, or you can obey them and respect them, but you have authority figures. If you're married, okay, it didn't quite come, but thank you for the blessing ahead of time. I'm sure I'll need it the next uh, when I sneeze. But uh, if you're a wife tonight, your authority figure in your home is your husband. And you can like it or lump it, disrespect it, disobey, doesn't matter. That's what God's word says. And I've learned a long time ago, God's smart and I'm not if I disagree with God. And uh, mankind is sure is dumb when they look at God and say, you're not smart or you're not right. No, God is infinitely smarter than we are. So a parent, right, is the authority figure of the children while they live at home. Any child that feels like, I don't have to do what you say, well, then you're, you're, you're just dumb. You're just, that's, that's ridiculous. You don't, you know, how would you do it to your, your mom gave birth to you. Your dad and your mom <coughs> combined together, and that's how you came into existence, of course, through God. And, and so your authority figure at your home is your parents. Respect them, obey them, right? If you have a job, and I don't, I don't need to raise your hand, but a lot of you have jobs. You have an authority figure. It's your boss or your supervisor or your manager maybe if you work directly under the owner of your company or business that you work for that's who you report to that's an authority figure in government you know we have politicians the highest authority figure in the land is the president of the united states we have police officers it's not good for you if a police officer is wanting to pull you over that you don't let them it's not good for you when a police officer pulls you over while you're driving to be disrespectful to the police officer. Why? Because they're your authority figure. And again, you don't have to like them. You don't have to you know, agree with all the authority structures, but the fact is you have authority. You know what the Bible says when, when it says, you call me Lord, you ready? That means Jesus is the highest authority figure. Of any authority figure you have in your life, you're supposed to obey God over your husband. Um, you're supposed to obey God over political um, 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 offices. So we're talking about if the authority figures disagree with God. We're not talking about just go ahead and disobey everybody. But if a, if a police officer or a politician says, like what happened in 2020, don't go to church. God says, go to church. So that's why we kept the doors open. We obeyed the Lord the highest authority figure in the land, right? If anybody ever says Christianity is illegal, still be a Christian. If anybody says you can't own a Bible, still own a Bible. Why? Because Jesus is supposed to be your Lord. I've had so many people in the 28 years leave our church because an authority figure in their life, not the Lord, but a husband or a parent or a, a, a you know, maybe not even an authority figure, a friend, doesn't matter, um, told them to leave and they said, okay, and God said, stay. And they said, no, I'm going to do what this person says. You see, that's, that's, that's because we're misplaced. Jesus isn't our Lord. Now, he can be your Savior and not your Lord, but that's not good. If you want to be a happy Christian, ready? Call Jesus your master and Lord. Look at Luke chapter 6. Go to Luke Chapter number six, and I'm going to give you a supplement passage to this being Jesus is your Lord. Luke chapter number six, and look down, if you would, please, at verse number 46. Now watch this carefully. Luke, <laughs> all these people, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Well, if that's true, bravo. I mean, honestly, way to go. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that's awesome. But look what Jesus says to these people, some of them. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he said this, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the, uh, uh, the flood arose, 
the uh, stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house and, uh, upon the earth against which the streams did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. All right, so here's what Jesus says. You ready for this? Don't call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say. Why, why say that I'm your Lord and you're doing your own thing? Why are you calling me Lord if you hear what I tell you to do and you don't do it? He says, I'll tell you what you're like. You're like a man who built a house on, a, on the sand and didn't have a foundation and your life is gonna be ruined because you don't do what I say. He said, but if I am your Lord, if you hear what I say and do it, he said, the, the, the storms of life will beat against you, but you're gonna be just fine because you're gonna make it through the storms of life because that's what I do. Jesus says, I give you the answers to life and I tell you what to do. And if you do what I say, everything's gonna be just fine. All these people that don't like what the Bible has to say about church or tithing or soul winning or just whatever doctrine in the Bible that people go, ah, I just get all bent out of shape about this. Go ahead and keep getting bent out of shape. Go ahead and don't do it. You're building your life on the sand and when the storms come great will be the fall and it doesn't have to be that way by the way how many of you are happy if you build a house and it falls flat on its face right I wouldn't be happy about that I want to build a house and make sure it stands the test of time God says you that'll make you happy right okay so hear what Jesus says and do it that's making him Lord of your life go back to John chapter 13 please Jesus said in John chapter 13 verse number 13 ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. So the first of the four things that Jesus said, if you know these things and do them, you'll be happy. Number one is call Jesus your master and Lord. Number two, look at verse number 14. Verse number 14 says, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Number two, write this down, serve each other. Are you listening? Serve each other. Serve each other. All right, here's what Jesus said. If I washed your feet, then you do the same thing to each other, okay? I wrote this down. Have a servant's heart. Don't live to be served, live to serve. This is how you should approach church the family of God. Don't you come here and just say, gimme, 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 gimme. I wanna be fed, I wanna hear something that makes me happy, and if I hear a sermon I don't like, or if someone doesn't treat me well, then I'm out of here. Why don't you come here with the mindset, I want to serve, I wanna be a blessing. I, I, and by the way, you know how you get real happiness in life? Is when you stop wanting people to serve you, but instead you start serving others. That's what's gonna make you happy. All, you know, I heard a preacher say this years ago, and I believe it to be true. You know what selfishness is? It's self-hell. You know how people can have heaven on earth and hell on earth? Selfish people live in hell on earth. People who live for others, they live in heaven on earth. Because that's what Jesus did. He said, I'm serving you by washing your feet. Now you serve each other. Now, Jesus, okay, here's the interpretation of the passage. You ready for this? It's not literal. See, why did they wash people's feet back in the Bible days? Does anybody have any idea why they washed feet in the Bible days, Tim? But what caused their feet to be stinky? What, what did they wear? Do you remember? Sandals, right. And what was Israel, by and large, as far as the terrain? It was a big what? Desert, right? It had the hills and mountains, but I mean, it was a very desert. What's in a desert? Dirt, sand, right? So here they are, they're walking, right, with sandals on. They didn't have Nike shoes. They didn't have Air Jordans, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's just, it wasn't invented yet. And so here's what happened. Whenever they would go into someone's house, typically speaking, they would take off their sandals and there would be a basin of water at the door with a towel. And when they walked into someone's home, they didn't wanna bring all that dirt in, so they would remove their sandals, 
park their sandals by the door, take the towel with the water and wash their own feet and then dry it off. And then they would walk into their, their friend or loved one's home, whoever it was, and not dirty up their house. And so here's what Jesus did. They walked into the house and he told all his disciples, stop, let me wash your feet. You don't wash your own feet. Let me do that for you. And that's what happened. They walked into the house and Jesus washed their feet. So today, do we wear sandals normally? Are we, are we in a deserty, you know, sandy terrain here in Colorado? No. So there's no real practical reason for us to literally have a basin of water at our front door, have a towel, and wash each other's feet. Why? Because typically speaking, our feet don't pick up a bunch of dirt necessarily. Now, what we do in our home, I like to do this, is I take my shoes off, you know, at my at my front door and park my shoes there and then walk around the house with my, my socks on, you know, and uh, I enjoy that. But the fact of the matter is uh, we don't have to literally wash each other feet each other's feet right now because that's not practical but here's what god is teaching we got to serve each other look over if you would please at luke chapter 22 luke chapter we're gonna look at two passages about this uh uh, point here luke chapter 22 and by the way you want to be a happy christian start serving others stop trying to say this is what i want Why don't you find out what other people want and help them to get it, if it's not anything bad, right? I'm not saying serve people with sin. That's just foolish. You don't don't say, hey, you want drugs? Let me go get them for you. You want to get drunk tonight? Here, I'll go to the store and buy you a bunch of beer. No, no, I mean, that's not, that's not what God's saying. You know, you don't, two wrongs don't make a right, or one wrong doesn't make a right either. Um, So, you know, when you serve each other, it's all within the boundaries of right not ever in a sinful way, okay? Luke chapter 22, look at verse number 25. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 25. Now, watch this. It says this, And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you let him be the as the younger and he that is chief as he that doth serve for whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth is not he that sitteth at meat but i am among you as he that serveth so here's what he's saying the gentile says the greatest person is the king the one who everyone serves he says no he says i'm the king of the universe am i sitting on a throne right now wanting all of y'all to serve me no he said i'm serving you so if i'm your king and i'm serving you then i don't want you to be like the gentiles having everybody serve you you serve other people all right, let's look at one more verse. Look at uh, a passage, Galatians chapter 5 now. Go to the book of Galatians, just a, uh, several books over to the right. After 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, right there. Look at chapter number 5, and let's look down, if you would please, at verse number 13. Uh, Galatians chapter number 5, and let's look at verse number 13. All right, look what it says now. Galatians chapter 5. And verse number 13, it says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only, you know, we got freedom, we got liberty, you know, we got grace, all that stuff, right? You've been called unto liberty. Here's what it says only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That's sin, by the way. Don't take your liberty and live in sin. Look what it says, but by love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that ye be not consumed one of another so here's what God says he says why don't you if you love each other serve each other that's the whole law is fulfilled in that. Serve each other, love each other, all right? So we see here Jesus is teaching his disciples four things. He says, happy are ye if you know these things and do them. The first thing he says that if you know and do is this, call Jesus your master and Lord. Number two, serve each other. By the way, don't, don't, don't resist the idea, if you're not working, of helping people move. 
Um, if, if this is an opportunity to practice what the Bible says. In love, serve one another. If you're a man here and you're not working at 10 o'clock in the morning on this coming Tuesday, then if you're free, please come down and help as we try to help somebody in their life that has a need. That's, that's biblical, it's right, and it's the right thing to do. Now, if you're working a job, then don't worry about it. There's no, don't feel bad about it in the slightest. It's for those that are available at 10 a.m., on Tuesday morning, we ought to rally around and help this person out. And that's what the Bible says. By love, serve one another. Jesus served us when he was here, and then he said, I want you to serve each other. Number three, go back to John chapter number 13. Now, if you would please look at verse number 15. John chapter 13 and verse number 15, uh, Jesus says, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Number three, write this down. Follow the example of Jesus. This is what Jesus was teaching his disciples. Follow the example of of Jesus. He was saying, follow my lead, follow my example. Now, listen this carefully. It's not just in washing people's feet that he said, follow my example. He said, he said this to mean this, in all areas of life. Ready for this? Follow me as a giver. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave. Stop griping about giving. Jesus gave, he gave. He says, follow my example. Jesus loved his enemies. As he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Follow his example, love your enemies. Jesus forgave people that wronged him. Follow his example by you forgiving people that wrong you. All right, Jesus was faithful. It says in the Bible that it was his custom to go to the house of God. And that word custom, it literally means every Saturday he went to the Sabbath, or went to the synagogue. Every Sabbath day. It was his custom. He was faithful. Follow Jesus' example by being faithful. Jesus was kind, he was loving, he was compassionate. Those are all examples that Jesus had. Jesus says, follow my example. If you want to be happy, the happiest Christians in this room are the Christians that say, Jesus, what would you do if you were in my shoes? And then do it. Live like Jesus would live. Let me give you one reference before I give you the final point. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2, please. First, we're doing good on time, by the way. And uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, please. And let's look down, if you would, at verse number 21. 1 Peter chapter number 2. This is a familiar verse, but it's important for us to read it right now. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Two, look down, if you would, at verse number 21. And it just simply says this. Are you listening? First Peter chapter 2, and look down at verse number 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So here's what God says. Every step of your life, you should follow the steps of Jesus. Follow his example. Live like him. You're a Christian, aren't you? You know what's more important to you, or should be, is the name Christian, not your name. The most important name I carry is not Corey David Sulian. It is Christian. The most important name I carry is not pastor. It is Christian. The most important name I carry is not American. It is Christian. The most important name I carry is not husband or father. It is Christian. Christian is number one on the list. You should always be in that mindset. What would Jesus do if he were in my shoes? I need to follow his example. Why? Because that's the happy life. The happy life. Ye are happy, he says, if you know these things and 
do them. What are these things that he says we should know and do? Number one, call Jesus your master and Lord. Number two, serve each other. Number three, follow the example of Jesus in all areas of, the, of your life. This is the key to living the happy Christian life. Number four and last, go back to John chapter number 13, please. And let's take a look, if you would, at verse number 16. John chapter um, uh, 13, and let's look down, if you would, please, at verse number 16. It simply says this, verily, verily, I say unto you, watch this now, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, this is a mindset, and this is point number four and last. Write this down. We are not greater than our Lord. That's what it says. We're not greater than our Lord. Now, what does that word greater mean? It means this, more important than. You ready? You know what this means? What you want is not more important than what Jesus wants. You are not greater than our Lord. What you believe is not more important than what Jesus believes. What you like is not more important than what Jesus likes. Here's what he says. You want to be a happy Christian? Understand your role. Stay in your lane. You are not greater than him. So what else does it mean, the word greater? It means above. God says you're not above him. You're not. So don't live like you are. And then the third thing that the word greater means is it means superior. So here's what Jesus said. <laughs> you're not superior than I am. You're not. You're not uh, above me, and you are not more important than me. So here's what he said. Don't let what I tell you to do be beneath you. You know the major problem? One of the major problems with our contemporary Christianity in our country, it's, it may not be this way in third world countries and other countries that I've been in on the mission trips. I want to tell you one of the major problems that we have in America in our Christianity is when the pastor gets up and tells you what the Bible says, often the response is, that's beneath me. That's beneath me. You see, we want to do something as a society, not we as everyone in here. I'm talking about the society of American culture. If we get the spotlight, if we get the applause. I had this one guy in our church several years ago got so mad at me because I didn't brag on him in church in front of everybody for something that he did. You know, there is a verse in the Bible that says, if you do it for the glory of man, the applause of man, he says, that's your reward. That's it. You ain't getting nothing from God. Get all bent out of shape because the pastor doesn't brag on him. Whatever, dude. You know what you ought to do? You ought to do it for the Lord whether anybody notices or not. If someone notices, fine. If someone doesn't notice, fine. You're not going to get bent out of shape because someone didn't publicly go, way to go, way to go, way to go. No, man, you're not above Jesus. All the glory goes to him. Everything that you do in this world ought to be for his honor and his glory. Don't ever make yourself the most important person in your life. Let Jesus be the most important person in your life. You want to be a happy Christian? This is the key to happiness. These things that Jesus has taught his disciples, they're in the scripture so that we can benefit from it. I put this down. In other words, living like Christ should not be beneath us. If you think that way, this comes from a false sense of pride and worth. A false sense of pride and worth. You know what you are? <laughs> you know, G Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, you're a pebble. And he was putting Peter in his proper place. He says, Peter, he says, you are a pebble. A pebble is a piece of dirt 
held together by moisture. He said, upon this rock, he was pointing to himself, this gigantic boulder, this chief cornerstone. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, Peter, you're a piece of dirt held together by moisture. Why would a piece of dirt held together by moisture get offended at this gigantic boulder cornerstone, this gigantic rock, Jesus Christ? I'll tell you why, because it's a misplaced self-pride and misplaced worth. You know what the Bible tells us? That God holds your breath in his hand. If you anger him, he can just take your breath away. Just like that. You don't want to anger him. Know your role. Stay in your lane. You look at Jesus and say, Jesus, I am not greater than you in my life. In other words, I'm not more important than you. I'm not above you. I'm not superior to you. I know my role. I know my lane. As the pastor of this church, I am commanded by God to preach what God tells me to preach. If people like it, they like it. If they don't like it, they don't like it. All I have to concern myself with is answering to him. If I do what he says, then everything will be fine, regardless of the outcome. But if I take it into my own hands and say, well, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what Jesus says. Whoa! Talk about not living long as the pastor of this church. For 28 and a half years, I have done my very, very best to give Jesus first place in my life. And that's how I'm going to live the rest of my life as long as I have sanity. Let me give you one last verse, and then we're going to conclude. You want to be a happy Christian? Look at Psalm 144. Go to the book of Psalms. 100. And by the way, we're, we're well on time. I'm going to let you get out early tonight. I'm letting you out early. No, no, I didn't say that at the beginning of the sermon. Don't, don't go, uh-oh. I said it at the end of the sermon. I am telling the truth. And if I ever tell you the truth again, I promise I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth right now. All right, here we go. Look at Psalm 144, verse number 15. I love this verse. Ready for this? Psalm 144, verse 15. Happy is this people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. You know what God says? <laughs> You want to be happy? I mean, like truly, truly happy in life? He says, let me be your Lord. You're happy in such a case if I am the ruler of your life. You're happy if not only I'm your master and Lord, but if you serve each other, if you follow the example of Jesus, and if you understand your role, you're not greater than Jesus. He says, if you understand these four things, if you know them and you do them, happy are ye. Happy are ye. So listen this carefully. It's up to you. Do you want to be a happy Christian? I think I want to be. I don't like having a griping and complaining and angry and mad at the world and whatever, man. I mean, I can't change the world. You know, I, so if I sit here, and I feed my brain all the garbage of this world and how terrible America is and how uh, uh, corrupt our politicians are and how COVID is bringing the end of the world and all this. I mean, if I just feed my brain with all that junk, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be pretty miserable, angry, upset, depressed, and down in the dumps. But you know what? I read this book and I understand America falls flat on its face. I also understand in the future that the Antichrist is going to rouse up a bunch of people on this planet to attack Jesus Christ, and every one of them is going to lose, and that we're on the winning side if you're on the side of Jesus. So you know what? I know the end of the book, the end of the story. We're going to make out just fine. So you know what? I don't have to lose my joy and lose my happiness because of the end times in which we find ourselves. I'm going to be happy because of these four things. Jesus is my Lord and Master. I'm going to live my life to serve, not to be served. I'm going to do my dead-level best 
to follow the example of Jesus. And then I'm going to know my role. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm not the most important person in my life. Jesus is. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I sure do love you, dear Lord, and I love these people here with all of my heart. And I just pray that you bless each and every one of them. Lord, if there's anybody here that needs to be saved, if there's anybody here that needs to be baptized, Lord, help them to make those important decisions tonight. If anybody here, the Holy Spirit of God has convicted them about something, Lord, it's my sincerest prayer that they'll respond with obedience. If anybody here has been inspired to live a certain way, help them to do it. They'll be happy. Father, help every person here tonight to do, not just know what the Bible says, but to also do it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you're here tonight and you need to be saved, if you're here tonight and you need to be baptized, please let me know. If God spoke to your heart during this invitation, please, you'll be happy if you let God have his way in your life tonight. Let's all stand together. Pianists will begin to play. You come and pray at the altar if you'd like, or you can pray in the pew. Whatever you'd like.